Welcome to another Meet the Manager. Today we're joined by Dr. Don Hampson from the Plato Australian Shares Income Fund. Welcome, Don. Thanks, Bert. Um, Don, the the Plato Fund's actually quite a, a different fund um, to, to many Australian share funds in particular. What exactly is different about the fund um, from a process point of view? Well, for a start, we built it bottom up for a, for a particular type of client, which is a pension phase superannuation client. Um, and they're different because they need income to live off. If you're retired, you actually draw down, so you actually need to, to live off that income, and so it actually has a high income target. Um, but I think you also need a high total return target if you're investing in equities. Um, the other thing is that you're taxed at a particular rate, which is actually zero, which is very beneficial, and we um, actually manage and tailor that portfolio from a zero tax perspective. Uh, also means by doing that, we actually um, are targeting shorter term income opportunities in the marketplace, so it's not your typical long-term buy and hold fund. We do hold stocks, some stocks for the long term, but we also can trade stocks to generate income um, because those clients need income to live off. So there's a lot of uh, income orientated uh, investment strategies, particularly in the Australian share market space. What's different about the way um, your fund generates that income? Yeah, well, a lot of the income strategies in the marketplace tend to be derivative-based strategies. So they, they generate some of their income by selling call options and, and doing so, those sorts of strategies, which can be fairly con confusing or, or fairly complex to understand exactly what they're doing. It also means that you're changing to some extent the, the risk-return characteristics of the portfolio. So they can be quite different to a normal market portfolio. The way we generate income is actually we don't use any derivatives at all. We basically just buy Australian dividend paying stocks. Um, we own them and we tend to own them um, when they're in their come dividend period and, we, and, and then we may actually, after they go X, we may take some profits on those stocks and move into other stocks that are paying dividends at a later time. Um, so by rotating our portfolio and actually actively managing our portfolio, we're able to generate substantially more income in the market, but actually it's all cash dividends and franking credits. And so obviously that type of strategy where you're looking at dividend timing, if you like, in yeah. terms of the, the timing parts of the year where the dividends are actually being, being paid, um, is going to create a bit of a, a bias towards the types of stocks that you'll be looking at at a particular point in time. How important is the bottom-up approach to stock selection as opposed to the potential dividend yield uh, equation? Well, I think you can't differentiate the two. I mean, uh, in fact, I think a bottom-up process is actually more required if you're going to tilt to dividend paying stocks because one of the problems about um, tilting to high dividend yield stocks in particular and obviously you're going to get more income out of those sort of stocks is they are often uh, trade on a high dividend yield because um, there's a substantial risk about them. In fact a recent situation just last week highlighted this where Metcash um, if you just looked at what it paid in dividends last year was trading at the end of May on a 17% yield. Um, including franking, and, and that's a very good yield. Um, and, and you know, someone offered you 17% yield, would say it's fantastic, except there are risks investing in shares. And in fact, in the first week of June last week, Metcash came out and said our earnings are down and we're not going to pay a dividend for the whole financial year. So no dividends at all for the next 12 months. So now it's trading on a zero yield, and obviously the share price has fallen even further. Um, so if you'd invested in that stock to get 16 or 17% income, now you're actually getting no income and you've lost 10 or 15% in terms of capital. And so it's very important if you're focusing on higher yield stocks um, to do the bottom-up research and understand whether that's a sustainable yield or whether it's a, a stock that is virtually unsustainable. Now, we didn't own Metcash. Um, and there's been a couple of other examples this year of similar stocks, so Bradkin or uh, Oz Minerals that have done the same thing, and we didn't own those stocks. So it's important we have a, a filter, what we call, it's actually a simple model, we call it a dividend trap. We try and... Um, we try and invest in high dividend yield stocks, but we want to avoid the dividend traps or the, or the dog stocks. And, um, you know, if you just look at in the Canberra Times or the Sydney Morning Herald, etc., and you look down the list of stocks and you look at their historical yield, it's actually not a very good way of investing because the higher the yield, actually the extremely high yield stocks are, are more likely to be a met cash situation. Um, we much prefer a stock, say a bank stock, which has still got a reasonable yield, but it's a sustainable yield. Banks are very profitable. They have high ROEs. Um, they're unlikely to cut their dividends unless we have a significant recessions, etc. So we much prefer those sorts of stocks. Um, and avoiding those high yield, extremely high yield stocks actually is, is a good way of preserving capital. 
So preserving capital is obviously very fundamentally important to most clients, but particularly um, if, if you're targeting clients in that pension phase of retirement. Um, what's the major ways that you look to preserve long-term capital within your investment strategy? Well, avoiding those capital losses is probably the biggest single way of, of, of making money and protecting capital. And, and as I said, we've got a pretty good record of avoiding the, the significant underperformance. Um, often they look cheap, and so simple analysis is, oh, this stock's trading on a very high yield or a very low PE. But if you look at inside the fundamental business, you look at the quality of that business, you look at the, the trend in that business, and Metcash is a classic one where if you actually look at the trend of of the retailers, it's actually been, you know, it's a pretty tough industry at the moment. You've got Aldi coming in at the cheap end, you've got Woolies being, you know, sort of, and Coles are at the high end, um, Metcash is in the middle, and there's potential other players likely to come in as well. So it's not a very good industry dynamic. Uh, those trends are very negative. Um, Metcash has probably made some poor investments as well. So it's important to analyse this company's bottom up and understand their business and, and look through uh, a number of layers of the business. So would you say the strength in, in, in what you do and the investment team does is in very much that bottom-up process or the timing of in and out of particular dividend plays? It's, it's a bit of both, actually. I mean, we actually model and value stocks from a long-term perspective, but we also add value by essentially timing the entry and exit to those stocks because there do seem to be repeatable patterns in the Australian marketplace, and they tend to be around dividend events where stocks tend to Good, solid, sustainable dividend-paying stocks tend to outperform, particularly in the in the couple of months before they go extra dividend. So we can make money by timing that, but also we make money by buying good quality stocks for the long term and avoiding those those dividend traps. So given that you're essentially running a bit more of a trading strategy around that dividend play, what sort of time frame would you generally look to hold a stock uh, in the portfolio? So if we're going into a stock just to get the dividend, we usually own them for about three months. Um, you need to own them for at least 45 days to satisfy the 45-day rule and keep the franking, but it tends to be that they tend to outperform the market for about three-month period prior to them going ex-dividend. So that's the optimal time period. Um, but the, we, we don't trade completely out of stocks, etc. I mean, there are some stocks where we may actually just overweight them. We might be overweight all year, but we'll be a little more overweight when they're in their, their come dividend period, if you like, and then we might take some profits once they go X. Uh, there are other stocks where we may only buy them for the dividend, and we might only hold them for two or three months for that dividend, and then we won't own them for the next two or three months. We may go back in and buy them if we expect them to pay a decent dividend in the in the second half of the year. So... With the, the strategy around dividend timing, that's obviously quite an active strategy. Yeah. There would be quite a lot of turnover in the, in the portfolio. And how does that affect the cost of running the portfolio and the potential risks? Yeah, well, we believe actually an active process can reduce risk rather than increase risk, actually, and being in a stock all year. So, for instance, Woolworths has actually been an underperformer for the last couple of years, but we've actually gone in and bought it just for short periods of time to get the dividend. And we've actually added value by doing that, and we've been underweight for the rest of the year. So we think actually having this, this shorter-term horizon can actually reduce risks. Um, sorry, the, the first part of your question, though, was... Um, uh, the, the costs involved. Yeah, the costs, yes, yeah. sorry. Um, we're very focused on efficient execution. I mean, clearly, um, we turn over our portfolio around one and a half times a year. So basically, we're about 150% turnover. Uh, transaction costs do impact returns, so our dealer or our dealers are very focused on having minimal market impact and minimal commission costs. Our average brokerage that we pay brokers is four basis points, which is 0.04%, um, because ultimately that reduces the return of the client, so we want to make sure that those costs are absolutely minimised. But what we find is that um, there are some costs in trading, but actually this the outperformance that is generated by that trading is far exceeds the cost of actual trading. So it's a relatively simple strategy and concept. You're looking for companies that are likely to perform better just before they pay a dividend, take the dividend and in particular the franking credit, uh, and then exit the stock somewhere around about, hopefully with a little bit of profit um, on the entry price. It would seem, at least on the surface, that's a pretty obvious sort of strategy. Why, why has that, um, that potential not been realised by the market more efficiently and therefore how does it continue to exist? Well, I think, and this is where, where we've thought th through this sort of thing, if, if you're managing pensions, um, they don't pay capital gains tax. So there's zero tax, they don't pay capital gains tax, but they do get franking credits. Um, 
much of the fund management industry is actually managed more from an accumulation perspective or even from an individual's high tax perspective, so maybe 49% is the current top marginal tax rate. And for those, particularly the top marginal tax rate investors, capital gains tax is actually quite important and minimising that. And, and so there's a tendency to adopt the buy and hold strategy and not realise capital gains. And when you're actually in, in if your money is invested in a, in a pension fund um, and, and, you, and you actually have retired, you don't pay any tax. So the old buy and hold strategy is no longer necessarily optimal. In fact, you, there aren't, isn't any penalty to turning your portfolio over. But it seems to us that most of the market is still in the buy and hold sort of strategy. And I've run teams before where the, you know, the analysts would say, well, I love, I love um, you know, National Australia Bank and I much prefer it to ANZ and so I'll, you know, they want to always be overweight NAB and always underweight ANZ. But what we find is um, that they both tend to outperform when they're in the come dividend period. So why, you know, maybe you should actually, even though you prefer one over the other, you should actually top up a little bit when one's in its come dividend period. So there are those opportunities that a lot of long-term fund you know, managers actually sort of may actually uh, leave on the table, but they don't. They leave those short, shorter-term opportunities. But it's not that we don't have a long-term view on stocks as well. We do have a long-term view, but we're also willing to trade around them. As I mentioned Woolworths before, we've generally played it from an underweight, but actually we have gone in for a short period of time to capture the dividend. So high yield is uh, fundamentally, uh, from a a general risk-reward perspective, would be considered to be a lower total long-term return. By by getting more of your yield up front, more of your return up front, fundamentally you're leaving less risk on the table. So from a at least a theoretical point of view, a higher yield strategy should generally deliver lower long-term returns. Um, your strategy, historically at least, doesn't seem to have suffered from that particular fate. Is there is there a reason why you think that um, that there's a sustainable outperformance running your strategy, even though essentially you're you know bringing more of the return forward by upping the the yield? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't necessarily agree with the view that the, the high yield actually has lower long-term returns. I mean, our, we've actually done quite a bit of research showing that, um, well, it, maybe I'll put it around the other way around. If you have a high yield, so you're actually paying out most of, a company's paying out most of its profits, obviously it's not investing as much back into its business as, say, a company with a low yield that might only, you know, re- which might reinvest almost all their profits back into their business. But our research shows that, um, unfortunately, companies tend to over-invest that companies that invest a lot into their business and probably have a low payout ratio and a low dividend yield often get it wrong. They overinvest, they um, you know, they race off and want to go overseas and invest money and often that ends in tears. Um, we actually find that and the high dividend yields, and in fact I think the dividend imputation system assists this, that if companies pay back a lot of their returns back to shareholders, it imposes a good discipline on the company because if they do want to go and invest in something, they probably have to come back to the capital market and raise equity or raise debt to invest in it um, because they haven't got a big amount of cash built up on their balance sheet. If you actually look at, say, US companies, they sit there with massive amounts of cash on their balance sheet, lazy balance sheets, and as often as a tendency is like, well, you know, we've got nothing better to do it, let's just go and invest in a project that might have a low ROE, and that ends up basically, you know, you're, you're wasting shareholders' money. So we think a high dividend yield policy, but not extremely high. It can get too high and you invest nothing in your business we don't like that, but a reasonable level of um, you know, dividend payout ratio is, is actually good, I think. So would it be fair to say then that um, while the fundamental truth might, might indicate that less risk on the table should mean lower total return in a practical sense because, again, human beings are involved in this process, you know, the theory doesn't always play it in practice, that you're essentially taking advantage of that disconnect between theory and... Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I'd put it another way around this is, if you think about what's more risky, uh, a cash in hand dividend that's paid to you or a capital gain which could be gone tomorrow if share prices collapse. And, you know, if you actually have a good cash flow coming, and good income coming to your investments, that's very tangible and capital is much more volatile than dividends. And if you actually look at, well, if you look at the volatility of the dividend stream out of the Australian equity market, is actually very low risk. It's actually been quite stable. Obviously, you look at the share price uh, you know, capital growth of the market, it's much, much more volatile. So it, we actually think that it, it's less risky to invest for an income stream than it is to invest for capital growth. Is this a strategy that would work in other markets other than the Australian market? Um, we believe so. We've done a little bit of research, um, but and it does seem to be a, a similar thing happens in other markets that stocks tend to outperform in that same sort of period. Um, 
and but it's only very preliminary, but but it does seem to work overseas as well. And so, why do you think that's the case? Why why would there be a tendency for companies to outperform just in those periods? Do you see that as something that is fundamentally driven, or do you think it's more of a market sentiment, you know, animal spirit sort of? Well, I think it's the latter. It's more market sentiment. I think um, th to some extent, I think there are certain investors that value income quite highly. And they see the stock's going to pay a nice cash dividend and they say, well, I need that income. And indeed, um, once the company actually announces a dividend, the, the, most, the, the strongest outperformance is in the week or two between the announcement of the dividend and the actual dividend next day. Um, the real question is to get the full run-up and we say we want two or three months type run-up. You need to actually buy stocks before you know whether they're going to pay a dividend or not. And that's the risk you take on the strategy. And that's why we're very focused on not going for the riskiest stocks and not going for, say, those stocks that are likely to be dividend traps. You've been at this for a long time. Tell me a little bit about your background and what led you into um, what is a relatively uh, unique strategy. Yeah, well, if you want to go right back, uh, when I was at university doing my PhD, I actually wrote a paper with a colleague about uh, the impact of dividend imputation. This is when Paul Keating first brought it in. I think legislation was 1986 and it actually was, uh, came out in 1987. Um, so we wrote a paper about how certain types of investors would like frank dividends. Um, Fifteen years ago I was at Westpac Investment Management running the Westpac Tax Effective Share Fund and uh, you know we were actually trying to um, build high income streams for investors but it was actually a little bit difficult because we had a one-size-fits-all fund with all sorts of clients and different tax rates. and. I think the learning experience of running that sort of billion dollar fund um, has helped us design a fund for a specific type of investor, the pension investor, which we think is largely overlooked by a lot of our competitors. And we've been able to build a strategy which we think sort of is, is right for those pension investors or for some pension investors. Uh, and that, that sort of, say, well, nearly 30 years experience has helped to develop this sort of strategy um, and refine it over time. The funds of it is designed very much with the pension investor in mind because of that play around um, ultimate tax rates and the difference between receiving income and capital. Um, is there a potential, you know, there's always talk about, particularly with superannuation and changing tax regimes, etc. I imagine you would have done a fair bit of testing around relative impact if there were to be changes to the tax rate and is it something that's likely to affect um, the, the end performance of the fund uh, if there was a change in, in tax on super? Um, well, certainly if they <coughs> um, got rid of dividend imputation, then, it, then the imputation credits, and we generate probably 1% more credits than the market, wouldn't be there because there would be no more uh, credits. Uh, I think by looking at the tax white paper and well, people like ourselves have put discussion papers in and we've made comments on, on uh, dividend imputation and we're strongly, and, and most people are strongly in favour of re retaining dividend imputation. Um, but one of the reasons why we've actually looked overseas as to what happens if where there aren't franking systems is do we see the same sort of share price behaviour and, and our preliminary results are we do see the same sort of behaviour. So even though they don't have franking credits, you still see stocks paying dividends tend to outperform in that couple of months around the dividend period. So we don't think it's going to be the, the, you know, the end of the strategy. But we, you know, if they did get rid of imputation, that would reduce the benefits. And with um, uh, other higher income strategies that rely a bit more on that timing, that aren't perhaps that that are a bit more mechanical in terms of particular use of derivatives versus that sort of bottom up approach that you employ, would you see that as a potentially more at risk if there was a change than than what you do, or because of that bottom up? I think it'd be. Well, I mean, I think one of the things is, yeah, we, by actually having bottling up and picking and picking stocks, I mean, these, you know, we are picking the best stocks. So if a good stock outperforms in that sort of dividend period, and you know, that is some of the value add that we have. It's not all about, you know, timing dividends. It's also about picking the right stocks. We don't buy every stock that pays a dividend. We, we, yeah, sort the wheat from the chaff.